Good afternoon, and on behalf of the Gilbert Lecture Series, welcome to this special event. We're so pleased to have two wonderful Princetonians, Deborah Perlman of the great class of 1996, in conversation with Chris Keeney of the great class of 1985. Before the program gets underway, I'd just like to make a couple of quick points. Um, first, we're anticipating about 40 minutes of discussion between our speakers, after which we'll take questions from the audience. If you're tuning into this event live, whatever platform you're on, you can get us your questions by typing them in the comments section at any time before or during the Q&A period. The earlier, the better. Or if you prefer, you may send an email to gilbertlectures at princeton.edu. And thank you in advance for taking the opportunity to pose questions to our special guests. Uh, now I'd like to invite Dr. Anita Sands to introduce our special guests. Anita will also return later as uh, she is doing us the great favor of moderating Q&A. Anita is the James Way Visiting Professor in Entrepreneurship in the Keller Center. She's a member of numerous public and private company boards of directors in the technology, real estate, and financial technology sectors. She's often called upon as an advisor and speaker and as a regular contributor to Forbes.com on the topics of leadership and strategy. She spent a decade in financial services, specializing in technology, innovation, and enterprise transformation before pivoting to a tech sector and portfolio career. Her undergraduate degree in physics and applied math, as well as her PhD in atomic and molecular physics are both from Queens University Belfast and she holds a master's in public policy and management from Carnegie Mellon, where she attended as a Fulbright scholar. Professor Sands, thank you very much for joining us today and uh, I'll turn it over to you now. Tom, thank you so much. It is a pleasure to be here and welcome everybody to uh, this fantastic session this afternoon. We are so honored to have Chris and Deborah joining us here. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce our two guests. I'll begin with our beloved uh, Chris Keeney. Uh, Chris is the founder and CEO of Rosemark Capital. He is a very successful entrepreneur in his own right, a business builder, a best-selling author, and of course, a beloved member of the faculty here at Princeton, where he teaches high-tech entrepreneurship at the Keller Center. For more than 30 years, Chris has been fascinated by the question of what motivates people to act as they do in a commercial context. And he's devoted his career to translating those kinds of insights about customer motivations into personalized sales and marketing techniques that accelerate enterprise growth. At Rosemark, he is applying these growth techniques to build a family of interdependent companies in customer marketing, focused on enhancing customer lifetime value through next-gen specialization. Chris is also the author of a fantastic best-selling book, Built for Growth, which I'd highly recommend, uh, which he co-authored with our wonderful colleague, John Danner here at Princeton. And that covers how the personalities of founders very much defines and shapes how new ventures grow and scale. He is the frequent speaker, uh, an active contributor to Forbes and a range of other media and magazine outlets and journals. And he's also appeared on CNBC, Forbes podcasts and a whole other host of media uh, outlets. Prior to his career at uh, founding Rosetta, uh, Chris co-led the retail marketing practice at First Manhattan Consulting Group. And that followed 10 years in marketing management at Johnson & Johnson, where he led the very well-known brands of like the likes of Band-Aid and Tylenol, um, those entire franchises, franchises. Chris earned his MBA from Harvard, um, and before that was a lovely history major here at Princeton. Um, he is joined this afternoon by yet another wonderful uh, history major here at Princeton, Deborah Perlman, who is the president and CEO of Revlon. Deborah um, is also a member, of course, of the board of directors there as well. And Revlon, as we all know, is a beauty trendsetter in the world of color cosmetics and hair care with a diversified portfolio of brands sold in approximately 150 countries around the world. As CEO, Deborah has focused Revlon's business around, tr around three strategic pillars. Oh, my Irish accent almost caught me out there. Uh, rapidly accelerating the e-commerce business, doubling down on the iconic Revlon and Elizabeth Arden brands uh, in their key markets, which are the US and China, 
and managing the company's cost structure to improve profitability. Some of the key accomplishments under her leadership include increasing the company's e-commerce net sales penetration from low single digits to over 20%, developing multi-year product development uh, pipelines and roadmaps ac across all of their key brands and implementing optimization and restructuring programs. Beyond just those business accomplishments, she is also actively driving very strong corporate governance, ethics, corporate social responsibility, including in critical areas such as equity, inclusion, and diversity. And under her leadership, Revlon has established employee-led social responsibility, inclusion, and diversity councils. Ms. Perlman is recognized for her very global perspective, her financial acumen, her deep passion for Revlon's brands and products, and she has a track record across her career of really driving innovation and actively seeking out new partnerships and new ways to disrupt the industry. Prior to her Revlon career, Deborah, Deborah previously served as a senior executive at McAndrews and Forbes, uh, which is a company that acquires and manages a diversified portfolio of public and private companies. She most recently served as executive vice president for strategy and new business development, where she focused on new technology investment opportunities, strategy and portfolio management. She is, in addition to all of that, the co-founder and vice chairman of the Child Mind Institute, an independent national nonprofit dedicated to transforming the lives of children and families struggling with mental health and learning disorders. Ms. Perlman earned her MBA from Columbia, and like I mentioned, as well as Chris, is a history major, was a history major here at Princeton. So Chris, my friend, over to you in the studio. Deborah, you are so welcome. I will leave it to you both and look forward to joining you for the Q&A. Thank you. Anita, thank you so much. Uh, and, and Debbie, it's just a pleasure to be with you. I think uh, perhaps one of the uh, themes of today is history majors do ultimately move beyond history and into the real world and, and have impact. And it's a thrill to, to be with you this afternoon. Thanks for your time uh, and for sharing your experiences with our students and our community today. Perhaps we could start um, with the first question of what has the last year been like? Oh my God, the tumult of COVID and social unrest and leader of a large organization like you are who's so involved with your employees, with your customers, with your communities. What has it been like leading in this environment? Well, thank you, Chris, for the question. And I just wanna take a moment first before I dive into that, really just to say thank you to Princeton for inviting me to be a part of this lecture today as well as thanking you, Chris and Anita, uh, for hosting me and for uh, Tom, to Tom, you and the team at Princeton, thank you for all the work to get us here today. So it's really appreciated. Um, so to your question, what's it been like? You know, I think it's been a really fast roller coaster ride, to be honest with you. I'm sure like many others, um, you know, being within the situation of COVID, within a global pandemic, it's very difficult just managing your own personal lives. And then obviously throw on top of that, you know, managing a multi-billion dollar company, it was definitely challenging. But, you know, it's like the old saying, you know, with, with every challenge, there is an opportunity. I'm actually in my office. Can you hold on one second? I just have to turn off my phone, sorry, one second. This, this lends legitimacy to the fact that this is a real live. Uh, it's live, it's live, you know what they say <laughs> about live TV. So here yeah. we go again. So multi-billion dollar company, you know, and, and managing it through, you know, a global pandemic. First and foremost, what, what I was focused on along with my leadership team was really around the health and safety of our employees. And you know, when we had, when we really recognized in terms of what the impact was gonna be, it was really around how do we really make sure that we were able to run the business, right? Yet ensure that the employees knew that their health and safety came first. Um, we worked very hard to ensure that we were keeping track of our offices that actually we ended up closing every office around the, the world. 
um, yet being able to still manufacture and distribute um, our products was extremely important. So we actually kept those sides of the business open. And we were able to do that throughout the throughout the pandemic. Um, and you know, I think that managing through that, though it was uh, extremely unpredictable, um, it I think the company like really stood up, and we did a very good job about that. We ended up where we had to, in moments of like a day, transform our company from being a very office based company um, to actually being virtual. So we had to move 4,000 employees, you know, not including our manufacturing and distribution centers uh, to a virtual environment and change the way in which we, we worked. So we had to, we definitely challenged ourselves in terms of what it meant to be agile in the workforce in order to really accomplish that. And I think that we stretched ourselves like many other companies to challenge you know, what does it really mean to be, you know, frankly, in the office and in, in, in working versus being virtual and working? And can you actually accomplish what you want to accomplish in a virtual setting? And frankly, for us, the answer was yes. You know, so what I would say that, you know, for us, it was really around, first and foremost, the health and safety. What I would go to in terms of your question is, you know, there are a lot of learnings, you know, there are a lot of learnings that occur during that period, this period of time. Um, and, you know, frankly, as a leader, what, you know, looking back, what I was very focused on were two main areas. One is communication and how do I increase transparency in a time of crisis, right? Which, you know, people were, if you, if you think back to when, you know, this happened about a year ago, there was so much uncertainty and it was how to give communication, even though you may not have all the answers, right? And you know, people are looking for answers, but it was really about how do we communicate in a transparent way with frequency, just so we were able to connect with the employee base, right? Which was a big learning for us. So it wasn't about quarterly earnings. It wasn't about financials. It was really about connection. And then the second piece was really around, you know, leading more with empathy. And, you know, it was a very unique situation. It still happens today where you're in, places you never expected in terms of how you communicate and where you're communicating with people. So you're in your their living rooms, right? You're yeah. in their bedrooms, you're in their kitchens with their kids yeah. and you see what people are going through, including ourselves, right? And that usually doesn't happen. You know, pre-COVID that didn't happen. You don't, you didn't see that, you didn't have a view to that. And, you know, when you get exposed to that, it really changes the conversation. And it changes how you connect as a leader and frankly, as a human being to the people around you in terms of, you know, the types of conversations you're having one, of course, on business, but also there brings forth a much more human element to that as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I love this point that you're making about how our humanity is both tested and ideally brought forth in moments of crisis. And I'm just kind of curious as you think about and prepare for returning to the office, and so we're not broadcasting ourselves in or from uh, intimate parts of our household but back into the, into the office, how do you preserve that level of human connection, which is certainly so important in every business, and I would imagine particularly important in your category, what aspects of what you learned in terms of those human connections might return in the office format? I think it's a great question. I, I think that, um, I think almost every company is probably thinking through what is what does it actually mean? What's the role of the office versus yeah. not? Um, the way that we are thinking about it is really much more around having a hybrid approach mm -hmm. going forward and really using the office much more as a connector, yeah. right? Much more as, you know, really driving to, you know, whether it's, you know, integrated in terms of uh, team meetings, as well as celebrations, right? So a big part of what happens in the office and people connecting is, is frankly that celebrating. Yeah. And, you know, that's yeah. where, how we're really thinking about it. And I, and I think it's actually a positive you know, when we think it was, it was difficult in terms of getting started, but in terms of 
really understanding, being able to give people uh, time back in their day, right? Yeah. That doesn't involve a commute, regardless of the amount of time. Yeah. It gives them the flexibility that if they need to do something in their life, that they can get it done, right, on, on their time yeah. um, and manage yeah. their work on their own. It's very empowering. Yeah. It's yeah, empowering yeah. For, for the company, but it's also very empowering for those in that environment, right? That there's yeah. that trust there, which I think has been built over this period of time. Yeah. I, I love that point of taking some of the frictions out of our lives. I think they somehow get absorbed. For many years, I commuted into New York from Princeton, and boy, that is a lot of life that runs up and down the New Jersey transit. And to have that time back and to be able to redistribute some of that time to uh, moments with your loved ones. Uh, it's, uh, it's such a great insight. Um, because uh, as you know, Debbie, I'm a digital marketer. I can't resist asking you this question, almost the same question, but related to your customers. Um, since um, digital provides so much opportunity to personalize and to make personally relevant your products and your brands and your positioning, um, how have you and how are you jumping the digital divide? You guys have been a digital leader for years. Um, what's happened with COVID and how has COVID affected your ability to use digital to build more personal relationships with your customers and your distributors and really your whole ecosystem? Mm -hmm. Well, you probably know this, the answer to this is probably as well as I do, but <laughs> given your background, but let me, you know, let me just take one step back so I just want to point, point to one other aspect in terms of learning throughout the year, which is really the cost of delay. Mm. So, and, and I think it's pertinent to, to what we would, what, I, what I'm going to discuss with e-commerce, but you know, what, what really became highlighted during the past year was when you have the, the situation we are in with the pandemic, right? I, I just feel that the cost of delay became that much more amplified. Mm. Um, and you really needed, at least I needed to understand, you know, when evaluating the business, you know, with imperfect information, right? Because there was so much uncertainty in the market. What are those trigger points, right? Where you need to really be faster in making those business decisions. Yeah. Right? And, and one of them was really, a, the biggest one for me was around e-commerce. And you know, it's interesting that, that in terms of how you positioned it, us as being ahead and you know, at Revlon, I've been very public with regards to where we started. We've actually, we were actually behind, yeah. right? So we had some catching up to do, uh, which Anita highlighted. Thank you, Anita, in terms of where we are today. And we've made a lot of progress with regards to e-commerce, but we're still on that journey. You know, like many companies, we're still on that journey. And so you know, when we were evaluating, when I was evaluating what we needed to do, in terms of addressing that, it really became, okay, we need to meet the consumers where they are, right? And that was changing, right? During that period of time as well. And, you know, it was really highlighting that the pandemic was not just really a disruptor, which it was the business, but it was also accelerating a lot of trends that we were seeing in the business. So it accelerated the conversion onto e-commerce. I'm sure that Many of you, you know, that are viewing this today are consumers and you did just that. You accelerated your use of e-commerce. And then also what we saw happening is that a lot of the channels that we're in were starting to merge, right? So there's a blurring of the line between, you know, your mass channel, your prestige channel, your specialty channel. So it really became, how are we going to address that? And a big part of that became e-commerce. And so we really focused on not only the back end side of e-commerce in terms of the digital infrastructure and where, where we need to invest in terms of the platform, making sure we had the right customers who we were working with, but it really became a lot more about how are we working internally, mm -hmm. right? So you take a, a, you know, a mid-sized company, right? It tends to be very siloed, right? So it became about how do we change the way we work to be really, really agile and much more um, much more focused on speed. And that was a big learning for us because we did change the way in which we work. We tested it with a small group on e-commerce, right? And we changed from silo to pretty much like what we call pods, 
yeah. where you had the decision maker, you know, on those pods and they ran the business, the mini business yeah. and accelerated through that. So it was both on the, the, what I call the commercial side, I guess it's three things, commercial back end, and then internally in terms of innovating how we are actually getting the work done in order to actually get to your question, to meet the needs of the consumer, to give us the ability to actually go out there and be on the platforms where the consumer is, whether it's marketing or from an actual commerce standpoint with e-commerce. Um, and it was, you know, we spent the past year doing that so that we could have that engagement. And then what we started to do is, is actually bring them into the development process, right? So we started to reach out and say, okay, well, we want the influencer now to be involved with how we actually go to market, right? And what pro have them on the ideation sessions in terms of what products we're actually creating, right? And combining that with data and insights to go to market. So big changes within the company, which was which is really exciting for us. Yeah, yeah, Debbie, thanks so much for that answer. And it actually underpins something perhaps we'll talk at the end uh, about, which is um, entrepreneurializing to turn the noun into a verb. It sounds like by creating these pods, you are actually creating little entrepreneurial units. And with those units, you were doing something that Anita and I teach in our classes along with our colleagues, which is so much of entrepreneurship is about dissolving the seam between the company and the consumer. And it sounds like this has been a year of dissolving that seam, whether it's within your teams or whether it's facing against the consumer with e-commerce. So it sounds like a, a very exciting transformation. What are you seeing, Chris, with regards to the shift in, in how consumers, what their motivation is, what the shifts have happened in the past year for their motivation? And I guess do you see, based on your own experience, you see, how much of that do you see sticking? Yeah. Yeah, um, you know that expression, it's hard to put the genie back in the bottle. I think this is uh, an appropriate label for this uh, issue as, um, as um, social media uh, enables those platforms to get to know you better and better and serve more relevant content. I think the consumers just, the expectation continues to rise that a brand um, like your set of brands or the brands I used to manage at Johnson & Johnson, the expectation is that you, the brand, really understand me. And so don't send me a message that's against my ethos or not the way I think about my condition, if it's a healthcare product or perhaps my own beauty. Uh, and so how do I make this uh, increasingly more relevant? And I think that it's a fairly low starting point where we would sell through distribution channels and not have a direct relationship with the consumer. And now that we have through digital opportunities to really understand motivations and preferences and the consumer's expectations of our actions become more and more tuned to our personal needs, um, the, the more likely that will uh, continue to occur. So I think it's actually a race for almost every brand to develop the methodologies and the processes to develop this more personal relationship. And it's gonna be exciting, right? You're not gonna get advertising that's irrelevant. You're not gonna get messaging that turns you off. Um, for some people, this is a little creepy, right? Some people say, oh my God, I don't really want you to know me that well. But um, the statistics suggest that that's actually a small minority, um, that most people would rather have something more personally relevant to them than something mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's dissonant. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I think I, the bar has been set really high. Yeah, like, yeah, it sure has, and it, it keeps rising. Yeah, I, I'd love to to turn to um, perhaps the the second um, very large, almost seismic effect that's happened to our society uh, with the terrible murder of George Floyd and the uh, appropriate reaction across our country about how we have to rethink, reinvent, reposition issues of diversity, inclusion. Um, representation. Um, as a corporate leader and as an important leader in our society, Debbie, I'm sure that our students and, and the rest of our community would love to hear what it's been like leading through that period of tumult and, and then what you and your, your leadership team are doing on these important dimensions. Mm -hmm. Look, I think, Chris, it's such an important topic, right? Uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion in terms of you know, how to address this uh, in our society and how to address this from a corporate standpoint. And 
throughout last year, what we, myself and the leadership team were really focused on is being outwardly facing and you know, communicating with the employees globally about our stance, my stance with regards to what was occurring in, in this country over that period of time and, and continues to occur. And you know how we were, you know, very public, frankly, on our social channels in terms of taking that stand. And it was very important for the employees to see that. And it really didn't stop there. You know, we really have spent a lot of time in terms of one having, as Anita mentioned, setting up our employee, our employee-led diversity and inclusion council, which really includes a three-year roadmap um, that we're holding ourselves to and measuring ourselves against. And Every single one of my leaders, including myself, right? These are now in our goals. So we are getting measured as leaders against how we are able to really act um, in a way that we think is um, appropriate for the time. And that gets cascaded throughout the organization. I think more and more organizations are holding themselves to a much higher level. And you know, what's interesting you know, to, to think about is frankly, how corporations in some ways can be leading versus government when it comes to societal issues and really setting a path uh, that is frankly, maybe much clearer and you know, maybe even much stronger than government is able to do today. And I think it's important leading a company like Revlon that we are out front. And frankly, that's in our history. You know, looking back at Revlon, Revlon has really been a company of firsts. You know, if I look back at the brands and the heritage, they're so rich, they're so iconic. You take Elizabeth Arden, who was out on the street with the suffragette movement, handing out red lipsticks, you know, or you, you know, you fast forward to Revlon in, in their marketing. You know, some of you, you know, listening to this can't believe it, but we were the first company to showcase a woman wearing pants in an ad, right, for Charlie Fragrance, right? We were the first company to showcase actually, you know, multi-ethnic models in our advertising in the 1980s. That wasn't so long ago. So we have a history of going out there and taking a stand for what we believe is right. Um, and we've done that again this time and we'll continue to do that because it's important not only as a corporation but and what we stand for within beauty, but it's also so important to the consumers. I mean, this is what their, you know, consumers are focused on. This is what they want to know. This goes back to, you know, what's the purpose of the of the company, right? And do I believe in what they stand for? So yeah. um, I appreciate you asking the question. You know, it's not always easy to ask that question. Yeah. Um, and I think that as we continue to, you know, see, see the world evolve, right? Hopefully for the better. I think you're going to continue to see corporations go out there and take these stands, or at least I hope so. I think it's yeah. important. Yeah. Yeah. It's fascinating to see what's happened in, in Georgia, right? I mean, first we saw sports teams, then we saw corporations. I mean, it really underscores your point that corporate leaders have now a whole nother level of responsibility to participate in these kinds of actions. And also to your point, have an enormous amount of leverage, potentially even more than the federal government does to bring about change and certainly not uh, the ability to bring about change quickly. It's, it's inspiring. Um, and I would imagine also a little bit um, complexifying to make up a word because you have a pretty complex job already. And uh, now there's a whole nother level to it, but it's also another level of responsibility that you're clearly um, you're, you're uh, living up to and, and then uh, performing at a very high level. Um, you know, I think it might be interesting, Debbie, for our students in the sort of third area of questions and then leave time for uh, live questions coming uh, through Anita, um, to talk directly to our students about how they can think about and potentially start plan and sh planning and shaping their career. I would imagine a, a number of us um, are wondering, how do you become the CEO of a major corporation like you've become? How do you make the decision between walking out of perhaps handing over your history thesis um, uh, in the last few weeks to starting to chart a path that could lead either to leading a major corporation or the students I tend to interact with wanting to start their own company that could become a major corporation. So just to say that a little more crisply, what's your advice 
uh, to people as they start to think about launching their careers and shaping their careers over the next few years. Yeah, well, it's certainly an exciting time, right, to be starting that journey. You know, I look, there's there's no there's no like one right answer for that. Um, but you know, look, I think what I would say is it really goes back to some of the points that I was making. Um, you know, with regards to more about companies, but it also applies to yourself, oneself, which is really trying to define, you know, what do you believe in? You know, what do you want to make an impact in? And look, I think what's really interesting about Princeton is Princeton, you know, part of their values is really to give a sense of your place within a broader world around you, right? And I, I think that that is such a such a head start, you know, when you're really looking at your career, because if you can really start thinking about what is that, what what impact you want to make, and how do you see yourself, you know, in the world around you, which is a big question, you know, I think as you can start identifying that, you'll get to, you know, where your passions lie. You're going to get to where you really want to make an impact. Like the funny thing is, that I thought I was going to be a history professor, right? Like that's what I thought I'd be a history professor. You know, I was like interviewing, I said, this is what I want to be. And then, you know, frankly, I realized in terms of what, what my impact, where I wanted to have an impact was, I didn't think I could do it there. Um, and I was really focused on, you know, where, where can you have, you know, where can you at least try and have a, a, a platform where you can really bring your passion uh, to, to bear, or at least align with the companies in which you decide to be a part of. And I think as you can start asking yourselves, you know, what am I passionate about, right? What, what am I interested in doing, right? As, as well as, you know, where, what do I want to actually be doing? And who do I want to be doing it with? Yeah. You know, I think that's really important. And I, I think if, if I were to look back, you know, and, and people always say this, what would you tell your younger self? Right. 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 You know, there are a couple of things I would tell my younger self. One, I would say, do not look for, external validation. That doesn't come, right? It just doesn't come. It's never going to come in the way that you actually want it to. So it really comes down to internal validation and having enough sense to who you are and, and taking that leap, right? Mm -hmm. I would say, yeah, and I can tend to be long-winded, Chris, so I'll try and be- No, concerned. no, there's, there, there are so <laughs> many jewels here. Keep, keep it rolling. I would say that, you know, I, my grandfather, who I worked with actually, and wow, he, that's he pretty cool. 101, wow. you know, he would say to me, he's like, you have to make the decision. He said, because if you don't, somebody's going to make it for you. And it, that's always worse. And that always sticks in my head. And I've talked to my organization about this is that it's your decision, you know, and it's your journey you're in the driver's seat and you know there are points in your career you may choose to be in the passenger seat but at the end of the day it's still your choice so just always remember that that you know your you know your power is in your decision and i think that you know as you go through the process and as you go through looking at where you want to go just keep that in mind that at the end of the day like that's you that's really that's your gift and yeah. it's not to be wasted yeah I think that's such a wonderful answer. And, and you used uh, three of the magic words um, that I just used on Tuesday in my final lecture of the semester. Um, passion, uh, it's intrinsic. It's about you, not about the external validation. And while you didn't use this word, you used the idea of curiosity. What is it, and you were talking about being a history major, perhaps we were history majors for the same reason. There was a curiosity that drew us into the content but then I, like you, discovered that I couldn't have the impact or was, was unlikely to have the impact in that field. But my curiosity and my passions had been fed by it as a student. One of the other things I, I often talk, to, uh, talk about with my students um, and those who come visit me is the question of mentoring. Um, and um, I think it'd be really helpful to hear you talk a little bit about your mentors. I mean, gosh, how many people get to work with their grandfather? That's amazing. I would imagine he must have been one of your mentors. But perhaps you could talk about a few mentors and, and then perhaps the whole process of being a mentor and being a mentee. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. So he was a mentor. 
he was he was definitely a mentor um, in a lot of ways. And uh, you know, in my career, like many people, right? And, and this is also in your personal life. You have sort of informal mentors, and you have more formalized mentors. Um, and at different points in your life, you can have you know a mix of both, or you can go down one path. Um, you know, when I first started my my career, and I started it actually at Revlon, um, I had you know my boss became my mentor, and you know she was an incredible. She is still an incredible woman. She had you know charted her own path, and you know she would really help guide me and gave me you know what you want is somebody that's going to give you very honest feedback. You know, especially when you're in a when you have a professional mentor, you want a guide who's going to be honest um, and it's going to be forthcoming and who's going to give you time. Right. And that's really, you know, that can be the tricky part is that people can sign on to be a mentor and actually not want to give you time. And then I've had a, a whole host of informal mentors over over the years where who I call for advice or, you know, you end up, you know, frankly, just developing a relationship with, even if they're not in the same industry because they've seen so much and you, you create that you know, informal type of relationship with regards to business. And those sometimes serve even better, right? Because you, you create your own advisory board, your own personal advisory board, which I think is frankly invaluable. And I would just encourage the students, you know, as you graduate, think about who you would want on that informal advisory board because from my perspective, it served me well, and people come in, people people come out. Um, I've certainly had my fair number of Princetonians on that. Um, I have a lot of Princeton graduates from my year, as well as many other years that have helped me along my career path. Some of them are doing that right now. Some of them might be listening. So I'm gonna say thank you to all of those who may be listening. Um, but it certainly isn't a one-man job, It is or a woman job. It is really about, you know, how to get the, the smartest and the brightest and, you know, the, the people that relate to you in terms of your goals as well as your values um, to give you that feedback on a consistent basis. Yeah, that's so it's, such it's, a it's invaluable, frankly. It's, it, I don't think it gets enough attention when you think about career development or personal development, but it definitely, um, it, it definitely is very important. One thing I will say, and this is a bit more personal, personal, professional, but when I turned 40, you know, I went out to my informal, uh, you know, advisory board, which consisted of, you know, different, you know, various ages, various, you know, men, women, et cetera. And I just asked them like one question about, you know, going into your, going into my forties, what's one thing that I should really that you think is most important for me to really go into this part of my life thinking about. And, you know, one person who I spoke to, it was very simple, but for me, very powerful. She said to me, whatever you choose to do, own it. It's yours. Yeah. And that became, a, you know, that's a filter, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's sure. Yours, is. You know, just own it. And so I, I just believe it's a great question. And I, I think that it just deserves more time. And hopefully you address it in your in your classes for people. Yeah, I try to. I try to. Hopefully you'll come to one of my classes. I'd love to. I'd love to. Oh, I do great. tend to oh. speak a lot. So you'd have to have like a, a stopwatch. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's really, really an inspiring place to leave it and uh, pass it off to Anita. I think it's um, it's fitting that we uh, concluded our, our discussion sort of where we started. And I just want to emphasize a theme, you talked about the humanity and the need to show up as an authentic person connecting humanly to your employees and to your customers. And we've come back around and you've reinforced that point once again, in terms of the humanity by which you have mentored and been mentored by others. And I think um, in this really kind of fast moving digital face in your computer, face in your uh, your mobile phone world. It's just such an important set of principles that, that you've laid out. And I really appreciate you reinforcing them. So Anita, Chris, over to you. Thank you, my friend. Well, first of all, very peeved because I was about to ask Deborah if she'd come and speak at my class in the fall. <laughs> so we, uh, we'll do it as a, pack, a package deal. We'll, How about that? We will go. We'll do like a master class and then and, and have, have Deborah come speak to everyone. But also, Deborah, for a guy who can make up a word like complexifying on the spot, like you, you got to you gotta hand it to this guy. Right? <laughs> I agree. So, 
<laughs> First of all, this was just such a great conversation. And, and as you know from Chris Debra, he'd be perfectly be happy to pepper you with questions and, and uh, take the spotlight off himself. So I'm going to try and ask a few of the questions that have come through that I think are a little bit applicable to both of you. Um, so maybe I'll start there and, and give you both the chance to, to bend some, some answers around. Um, well, one of the first questions that obviously came up is that you kind of both started off in the same place as history uh, majors at Princeton. Uh, so one of the students has asked, um, what did you learn at Princeton that still impacts how you work today? Uh, was it maybe it's the way you approach problems or, or think about customers or corporate social responsibility? So, Chris, maybe I'll give uh, Deborah a chance to catch her breath and, and start with you and then we'll hand it to her. But what, what did you know, what's one thing you both took from your, your Princeton experience? Sure, sure. Thank you for the question. Yeah, I think um, the best part of Princeton is that it teaches you how to think rigorously, formulate um, cogent arguments, and then sell those arguments, also known as writing a paper or writing a thesis. I sometimes joke, because I live here in town, and a lot of Princeton alums do, and this is not an exaggeration. I graduated now 36 years ago. We'll still stand in the corner talking about our thesis. <laughs> a statement that is. That may be a statement about I have boring friends, I don't know. But I think what it really reinforces is that capstone experience of having to build a cogent argument over what could be 100 pages or more. That training, I think, shows up every time I write a PowerPoint, every time I write a recommendation, every time. So the rigor of developing an argument that is then analyzed or critiqued um, is just hugely valuable across all of business. That's wonderful. And Deborah, what about you? You also have to present arguments uh, every quarter to your, your shareholders and so forth, but what did you take from your Princeton experience? I say I feel like I have to I have to prepare arguments like every day, <laughs> maybe every every meeting, but but I, I could not agree more with what Chris said. I think that, you know, just having that preparation is invaluable. And frankly, it is applicable in any type of situation, particularly in business. I was just going to add on and just say the rigor in which you uh, really gain a, a skill in analysis, mm -hmm. right? So whether you're a history major, you do one way, right? Or whether you you have majors such as yours, Anita, which some of them I couldn't even pronounce, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> no, the <so>. difference. <laughs> like your <you>, words. <laughs> whether regardless of the major, you know, Princeton does such a good job in terms of really teaching that skill, and you know that is that's not easy to do certainly, um, but it definitely comes. It, it's really invaluable in life, but certainly in in business. And then. One thing I would add there is, frankly, um, your fellow students, right. right? I think it's less about, you know, it's what they teach you that's really invaluable. And, you know, those moments where you are probably talking about your thesis, they also include moments where, you know, you were, you know, with either those people or others and really what it meant and those moments that you had together. You know, I, I would say that it also taught me in some ways how to procrastinate by writing that thesis in Firestone Library, which some of you may have experienced as well. I think we can be professional procrastinators as well, but really I think it came down to what Chris was saying as well as your fellow students. And don't take that for granted because people pop up in all aspects of your life that are from Princeton and it really is in incredible in terms of that connection. Well, I think, and Deborah, that actually brings me on to a question I was going to ask, which was about the importance of your network. And I think what you've just referenced there is that maybe what students mightn't appreciate is that the friends and peers that they have today are sort of maybe the seeds of what becomes a really great network of relationships. And Chris sounds like many of people in your network today were, were also with you at Princeton as well. I know you spoke about the importance of mentors and, and uh, that sort of advisory board, but could you maybe share with the students just your thoughts on on networks and building relationships, because I think a lot of them think networking and they go, oh, that's, you know, that's a bit of a sleazy word. But yet I think Chris, you and I certainly would share that when you're an entrepreneur, 
bringing you know resources to your idea and a lot of that obviously are attached to people that are in your network or been able to to have a network to draw on it can be a huge uh, you know point of differentiation so would maybe both of you just share some of your thoughts on developing your network or how you how you've thought about it over the years yeah i'm happy to get the bidding started here um first i'm definitely one of those reactions to the word network, but then of course I do a lot of quote networking. Um, and I think that the most important uh, part of building your network um, is, is a lot of the issues we, De Debbie and I were talking about before, which is show up authentically, um, be of service to the other person, be driven by your own curiosity and interests. And when you're bringing value uh, to others, um, your, your network almost forms in and of itself. People want to help you, you want to help them. Um, I think the people who are kind of trying to get their uh, LinkedIn numbers up to 3,000 or 4,000 to 5,000, and they don't really know these people, and it's that's, that's the kind of sleazy version, but I think the really authentic version of, hey, I really want to help serve a community of people who share a curiosity that I have it actually has this multiplicative effect. I'm going to say it again. I agree. I agree. I think it's a really important point, you know, when you, when, when you make the distinction, because with a network, you really are in service of the network. They are not in service for you. And I, I think if you go, if you have that mindset shift where you think it's that they are, you know, that you're, they're getting, you, you, that you're looking to get something from them, right? Versus really servicing them. I think it really opens up a whole different view of what you actually can create with the network because it really is about relationships and that connection and that humanity that we've been speaking about. And I do think that there has been frankly a, a big shift, at least I like to believe there's been a big shift in the business world, you know, where you're able to bring more of that humanity to the table and frankly, if you have the right network, you know, that's what they're going to appreciate, right? Because that's where you're going to, both sides are going to get the most value. That's, that's right. That's right. Um, now, another point, of course, that you both have in common is you both went to business school after, after your undergrad. Uh, so one of our students was curious about... Um, she says, or he says, I'm not entirely sure, I'm torn between pursuing a career after Princeton or continuing to graduate or business school. Uh, what was your kind of philosophy on this? And what might you advise students today if we were, who are at a similar juncture? So how did both of you uh, kind of figure that step out for yourselves? Maybe you want to take the first shot at that or would you like me to? I mean, I can certainly take a stab at it. Mine was sort of much, was sort of simple. Right. In terms of I, I, I knew where I wanted to go, but I needed the tools to get there. And, you know, based on my, you know, major at Princeton, I didn't have all those tools. So I really looked at it as building tools in my toolkit um, so that when I went out in, in, into, into the business world, I felt that I had the competency at least to start. Mm -hmm. Right. And then build on that. So you really looked at it as a foundation, a foundation for what I wanted to do. And that was the biggest driver. Yeah, yeah, I, I strongly agree with that. And and perhaps the the question, sort of before the question, is um, what what is it? What tools are you trying to acquire? Um, and so uh, I I like to sort of joke with my students that you know if you want to be a bond trader, going to business school is probably not a good idea because you could become a better bond trader by doing it for two years. <laughs> you know, probably make more money than having to uh, pay a tuition. Um, but if you want to be a leader, a general manager, an entrepreneur, uh, a, a corporate leader, um, there are a lot of tools you need, a lot of tools. And you can learn those tools by doing, but you can build that foundation, just as Debbie said, much more efficiently by devoting two years to it. So when you go to business school and you're learning about operations and you're learning about organizational design, you're learning about marketing and you're learning about finance, you just learn much more efficiently. Yet the other thing is that um, although the seniors at Princeton are probably really ready to stop going to classes, <laughs> stop doing homework, going off and earning some money, amazing thing happens three or four years out, which is you realize how much fun it is to be in school. 
Yeah. And so there's this incredible desire to go back to school, to have friends like you have friends in school, and then to learn the toolkit that Debbie talked about. So it's not for everyone, um, but I think for those who seek uh, to be, uh, you know, nonprofit leaders, corporate leaders, entrepreneurial leaders, business school can be a real accelerant, just as Debbie said, in building right. that foundation. And of course, you meet another set of really great people, right, who, who are in your yeah. business school class as well. So another great set of, of relationships that you will have uh, for life, you know. Um, so one a great question here, I think, you know, uh, we all have career journeys with ups and downs and turning points. Um, so one of the students asking, can you describe kind of like a moment where you had a big aha moment in your career or, or a, a juncture that sort of marked a significant turning point? So Chris, maybe I'll start with you because because we all know yeah. you've a, you've a fascinating. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, yeah. So so mine is a little bit unexpected because I left J and J and or left Princeton and then um, went to Johnson Johnson, uh, where my mentor was the CEO of Johnson Johnson, and I always wanted to learn how to have his job. And for 10 years, I was on this fairly steep curve through product management, and I finally got the chance to run the biggest brand in the company at that point, the adult Tylenol brand, a billion dollars in, in revenue and $600 million in marketing expenses. And on day nine, I remember going home and sitting in my driveway with my head on the steering wheel going, oh my God, I hate this job. And it was such a, I couldn't believe it. Um, my whole career, I was just aspiring to get this job. And what I realized at that time was that what I was most excited about was actually figuring out consumer brand choice, making the marketing brand and strategy decisions. And when you're running a brand that big, even as the franchise director, which is kind of like a middle market, middle management job, you didn't do any of the work anymore. You just managed the people who managed the people who managed the people who did the work. The conductor. So it was really tough. Uh, and that was really the beginning of my journey into becoming an entrepreneur. But it was a real moment of crisis. I could not believe this thing that I'd been working on for so long was just not what I wanted it to be. Wow. And Deborah, what about you? Were there moments where something didn't turn out to be what you thought or or when you look back now kind of really interesting pivot points that you didn't maybe see them as exactly that at the time but they turned out to be look i think like my, my path is a little bit different right because i've been sort of in revlon in a public company i've been in a family office right so i've been i've, I've done things a little bit differently and i've always gone towards you know where i think there's an opportunity even if it's really been going to be a challenge and frankly even if it's going to be a lateral move or even a move that takes me a step back, right? So, you know, I'll just give one example or perceived step back though it really wasn't. You know, when I was um, coming out of business school, I went back to Revlon and I worked um, as, a, as a brand, as an assistant brand manager and then was on that path of brand manager. And actually, you know, my father called me up and he said, you know, we really need an analyst over here. That's right. I'm like <laughs> analyst. Right. I mean, I, I think I could be more than an analyst, but frankly, I sort of knew what I didn't know. Right. And I thought, you know what, maybe I'm a little bit too old, but that was just a perception at the time. And I ended up doing it because I thought, you know what, I'm going to be around really smart people. I'm going to do something. I'm going to get a different perspective mm -hmm. from uh, an investment standpoint, but also from, um, a, you know, a, a company standpoint. And so I, I took that leap right, which was a great leap to take. I was there for, you know, 14 years and I got to work on a whole bunch of acquisitions. I got to work on transforming companies. Um, it was an incredible period of time. It was also a period of time where, you know, I, you know, managed my career while having four kids. Wow. Right? So, you know, you, you, there are certain moments during that period of time where you have to make those decisions of, do I want to keep moving up? Or am I going to just hold in place for a bit because I have other things in my life that are going on that, you know, may need to take that front seat versus the back seat. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's okay. Right. Making those decisions okay. and saying certain okay. things I'm solving for at certain points. That's really important. Right. It's really important. It doesn't all have to be, you know, the, the prize, you know, it actually can be that, 
you know, it's, it's not all about the accomplishment that is, you know, driven through business. There are a lot of personal accomplishments that are clearly equally as amazing. And, you know, I would say that whoever said there was a balance to being a, a working mother, right, or working father, frankly, really didn't, didn't really know that that doesn't exist. Uh, hasn't tried it yet. <laughs> yeah. um, so, okay. every day, you know. Ab absolutely. Um, tell me one thing that both of you have learned about yourself in this past year, right? So we're coming hopefully out the other end of the tunnel and uh, we've learned lots of good and bad things about ourselves as, as humans and everything else. What's one thing you'd like to take with you or one thing, uh, you know, you've learned in the course of 2020, 2021 that you, you don't want to forget after life kind of returns back to some form of new normal or next normal. Chris, what about you? What a... Uh, that's yeah. a big lesson learned, uh, your wisdom from, from 2020. I think it, it actually connects to what Debbie was just talking about, although I didn't have four children in the last year, uh, <laughs> which is amazing that you did that and continued on in your career and, and became CEO. So kudos to you for uh, being able to create that balance. That's inspiring. Now, I, I think it's actually something we've been talking about almost throughout this discussion on um, you know, there, there's an advantage and a disadvantage to Zoom. One of the advantages is everybody shows up right at the minute. The disadvantage is every Zoom call is, and you know, you get to the end of the day and you're kind of Zoomified, right? It is, yeah. Um, and so I found that Zoom has allowed me to access old friendships for short 20 or 30 minute visits that I don't think ever would have happened. Um, Debbie and I have talked about our business school experience. Um, one of the great advantages in going to business school is, it, as you said, Anita, it's a whole new set of friends. The reality is that socializing in business school is almost as big or bigger than socializing in Princeton. And so my section um, has created a quarterly Zoom call where we all get on the phone or on Zoom for an hour every quarter. That used to happen every five years. It's now happened five times in the last year. And so I hope that through this technology we've all become addicted to, um, I get to have those human interactions, not just the z -z 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 Zoom meetings. I hope those continue. And, and what that's allowed me to do is have a human connection uh, with a much broader range of friends that I wouldn't touch uh, otherwise. Yeah, and Deborah, what about you? What are you uh, taking with you as a good carry forward from 2020? Well, you know, I have to say I had a very similar experience, but I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to build on that one. But, you know, what I would, what I would add is probably an adjacent to that, which is really um, reprioritizing my time mm -hmm. yeah. and how I spend my time. And, you know, in, in some ways, you know, I, I, I said, said to somebody, you know, uh, throughout the year, I said, I don't think I've been home this much in 20 years, you know, so. So it really did, it actually, I'm laughing, but it actually really did teach me in terms of, you know, the different values of making those choices and frankly, back to my decisions, making those decisions about how to take control of my time. Yeah. And I hope to be able to bring that forward, right? That's my goal. I have little post-it notes around my desk to make sure that I do as little reminders. Um, but I think that that's one. And then the other one that I would say is that I, I think that when you, you're on the Zoom, right, it really for me became, you know, what are those, asking myself the questions, what are those moments of influence, right? Mm -hmm. and, and how to really capture them in different ways versus, you know, when you're in an, an office, you know, or you're more in person, sometimes I think that can get lost. And so that's also another takeaway for me. But since we, I think we have a couple more minutes, but Anita, I'd love to hear from you also, is that, is there any takeaway that, that you'll have from this year? I, I really think it's about, about time and travel. Um, I, you know, I, I think I, I don't relish the idea. Um, I remember a few, few weeks back, you know, I started hearing the airplanes again in the, in the sky at sort of six in the morning. And I literally had a few mornings of like, 
PTSD, you're going, oh, there's going to come a day when I'm going to have to be on that flight at 6 a.m. Please, no, don't let those guys open up again. Um, I, I'm not going, I don't want to go back to doing that, to being on the road the whole time. I just I just think it's made me appreciate the value of time with family. And, and I also think I'm optimistic that we've all realized that there's so much we can do by Zoom. Like we don't want to do back-to-back -back Zooms. And there's certainly some things, whether it's creativity and getting together as a team and culture building, you have to be in person. Person. but I also really hope that like I look at CEOs like you Deborah and other big CEOs flying to meet each other for an hour uh, versus sort of both you know two CEOs jumping on the phone and having a quick discussion to talk what you need to talk about that's just a much more efficient use of of, of kind of really senior people's time um, so I'm hoping we'll get to sort of a new uh, version of traveling and, and getting together what's really important and valuable and then you know, sort of normalizing a little around. There's certain things that are perfectly okay with Zoom, <laughs> and and we can we can take some time back for for life. Um, so I, I love that. Um, that's where my optimism lies. You know, now I am getting the the virtual stink I hear from Tom about wrapping things up. So Tom, let me hand it back to you. But first, may I say a huge thanks to our two wonderful Princeton alums, our history majors, uh, and uh, of course Deborah, to you, our special guest. Thank you for your time. Chris, you are the host with the most, as always. Um, so Tom, back to you in the studio, my friend, and thank you for, for giving us this opportunity to get together this afternoon. No, great, thank you. My goodness, what a wonderful conversation. And I'm so sorry to cut it short. Uh, thank you, Professor Sands, Professor Keeney, Debbie Perlman, thanks so much for a fantastic hour. Thanks for all who tuned in live and for anybody who's watching this later. We hope you'll we'll have your company again for future events. But uh, for now, we'll say good night uh, from the Gilbert Lectures. Thank you and uh, take care. Great. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Bye. Bye.